Nagaland, a place where swirling clouds gently kiss the mighty hills, where nature preserves in its bosom the primeval traditions of the land, where a picturesque sight awaits at every blink, where ethnic notes conflate with contemporary melodies. That's Nagaland for you, a vibrant hill state in the northeastern corner of India. I started with the capital of Nagaland, Kohima, and my first stop was at Commonwealth War Cemetery. When you go home, tell them of us, and say that for their tomorrow we gave our today. The epitaph in this cemetery is dedicated to the 10,000 Allied soldiers who lost their lives during the Japanese invasion during World War II. Next, I accompanied my friend Alam to the Kohima Cathedral, Mary Help of Christians Church. Catholic Cathedral Kohima is an architectural landmark, unique in many ways. Then we headed towards the Kedi Baptist Church, Kohima Village, where we met some local boys from the Angami tribe shooting hoop. Kohima Village is also called Barabasti, or Large Village, which is the second largest village in Asia and largest in Nagaland. The final stop at Kohima was the Kohima Museum. Normally, photography is not allowed inside the museum, but we somehow managed to get a sneak peek at some traditional Naga musical instruments. So I bid farewell to my friend Alem and headed north to my next destination. One cannot go to Nagaland and not visit Mokukchung, home of the Ao Naga tribe. The beauty of this place lies in the contours of the land, which are characterized by six hill ranges running parallel to each other. It's a modern city, complete with cement buildings and even traffic jams. My lovely companion Wati took me to Ungma, the largest and oldest village of the Ao tribe, and the second largest in Nagaland. We entered the village and came upon a pillar that leads to heaven, wandered the colorful streets, took in the village houses and the gardens teeming with flowers, and came to a morong, a structure that lies at the core of Naga society. Here is where traditional beliefs, customs, and social behavior are passed to new generations of warriors. We also caught a glimpse of the Lokcham, an enormous drum made from a tree trunk that was played in ancient times to communicate with other villages. Our sightseeing also included the First Baptist Church, founded by Dr. E. W. Clark in 1876. Wati next showed me the water source for all the families in the village, with its many pipes and taps. Next, we saw the Ungma Community Hall, took in a panoramic of the village, and saw the local school founded in 1914. While walking through the village, we heard the sounds of some blues guitar coming from one of the huts. Descending through a hole in the floor, we came upon a basement jam session, where Pongchi, a Pong, and their friends were rocking out on the guitar. The family gave a warm welcome to their surprise visitors, and even gave me an impromptu sewing lesson. I couldn't help but notice the beautiful children looking smart in their school uniforms and even took some time to smell the flowers. We took a visit to the local cemetery and wandered through the graves, inscribed with the names of the local deceased. Wati translated some of the inscriptions and dedications in our language. Wati next took me to the local park, 
where we saw fearsome, stinging caterpillars and took a few spills on the Naga slides. The view of the forest there was overwhelming. As we moved out of the park, Wati suggested a stop in the village of Setsu. There I was introduced to some of the local villagers, including Wati's grandmother, who offered me tea and their cat. She taught me an important phrase in our tongue, Kanga Pilar, which means thank you. Next, Wati took me to the village of Longkum to see a local scholar and scientist by the name of S. Ayim Longkumer. All of his work. Wati translated his clever jokes in the Ao tongue, and we checked out his workshop. We had to enter through a small handmade door and follow a tunnel to come upon his laboratory. Dust. It had all the makings of mad science. This all Mr. S. Ayim Longkumer seemed capable of cooking up anything in his workshop lab, from traditional Naga crafts, to scientific instruments, to sofas. It was my first glimpse of so many traditional Naga crafts, like boar tusk necklaces, decorated gourds, handmade baskets, and even boots. The hornbill bird is a traditional symbol of Nagaland. I was mesmerized by his work, but Wati still had more to show me. During the villages and forests, Wati and I discussed some of the traditions in Naga culture. Intertribal marriages are becoming a common practice as cultural identities broaden. Nagaland is a world of contrasts and transformations, a place where tradition mingles with modern life. Wati then led me to a mystical Naga staircase known as Long Langba. Legend has it that the staircase was inhabited by a beautiful girl named Itiban and her less than handsome boyfriend, Chinna. We could see their bed, their footprints, and even their butt prints. Chinna and Itiban the Romeo and Juliet of the Owls. Wati led me through so many forests and so deeply into the woods that I was beginning to think she was going to play a trick on me and abandon me there in the jungle. Fortunately, I was able to retrace my steps and get back to civilization. In Nagaland, guests are treated with warmth and hospitality. When we saw a group of elderly men deep in conversation, we waltzed right in and joined them. In a culture in which young people still have respect for the elderly, anybody can visit anybody. Soon we were offered smoked pork, plums, and plenty of affection. Probably they would have hosted us for a week, if only we'd had the time to stay. We sat entranced as a beautiful elderly couple known only as Otsula and Opu 
for Grandma and Grandpa sang us a traditional love duet in our language. First, Atsula sang her part. Then Opu picked up where she left off. This back and forth is typical of our musical culture. I was captivated by Atsula's jewelry and Opu's handmade shawl. When we got back to Mokokchung, it was Wati's turn to hum a few more numbers in our tongue. Tsukumi and Akum Lideng. Nagaland is essentially driven by agriculture, and there, hardworking farmers are a common sight in all its districts. On my way to the village of Mopongchuket, I passed many hardworking village people, happily going about their daily chores. Mopongchuket is a village within Mokokchung district, and also happens to be one of the cleanest in northeast India. A cook told me the village was founded in the 10th or 11th century. He took me on a whirlwind tour of the sights the village had to offer. Potentially hazardous hanging bridges, the Sumkotanem Lake, and finally, on a walk through the trees to a local sculpture garden. These modern sculptures seem to reinterpret the traditional motifs of Naga art. Hands, hornbill birds, and family members expressing love. Above us, the time pillar seemed to soar into infinity. The origin of the village's name, Mopongchuket, is based on a tale associated with a fan palm leaf. Together we took a stroll through Langrentinum Park with its traditional bamboo morong and shaky steps. Our next stop was Mangkolong Tea Garden, where a cook and I wandered through a twisting labyrinth of tea hedges. Before leaving Mopongchuket, we visited a church where a choir of elders was singing church songs in our language. Singers such as Chunumula and Toshi Minla sang us a hymn entitled Isu Ano Arotaki. Over 70% of Nagaland's population is Christian, and its influence is seen in the contemporary music. We also stopped for a delicious supper of pork, greens, and a hot chutney made out of ghost pepper, prepared by a cook's family. After dinner, I enjoyed a drink of misinchi, the local rice beer, and picked up some traditional Ao dance steps, and passed on a few moves from American square dancing as well. The day ended with an enchanting sight of the sunset in Mokokchum. The next day, we set off for the domain of the Konyak tribe, a remote area known as Mon. It is bound on the north by Assam, on the south by Twensang district, on the east by Myanmar, and on the west by Mokokchung districts of Nagaland. Mon is a place lost in time and space, where children still travel to school on piggyback. In Lungwa, we entered a mysterious house full of carvings, the ceiling and walls black with soot from the open fire. The house was full of traditional artifacts, animal skulls, and jewelry. I learned that the Konyaks were the only tribe to create brass statuettes in the form of human figures. Next, we visited a Konyak chief whose house lies on the border between India and Myanmar. The chief and his wives cook dinner in one country and sleep in another. The Ans, or Konyak Naga chief, in Shingyachu village, belong to the ruling clan of the Konyak, who are distributed in Arunachal Pradesh, 
the Mon district of Nagaland, and in Myanmar. Powerful Ongs or chiefs rule respective villages. I took some time to see some of the other sites in the village, eerily covered in fog and mist. We passed several local figures, chiefs and astrologers, dressed in characteristic cognac costume. It seems everyone was working on something. On the roads, in the fields, and in the home. Even I tried to join them in their daily routine. In Shangnyu, we went to the spellbinding Morung, famous for its ghostly collection of animal and human skulls, relics from the days of headhunting. All good things come to an end, and so did my trip to Nagaland. I was physically transported back to the bustling streets of the city, but my heart still lingered on in the mystic woods of Nagaland. I remembered the famous words, The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, miles to go before I sleep.